So my name is Ken Rimple. I work at Chariot Solutions. I've been there now for 10 years. I'm the director of education, uh, building training classes. Most of them lately have been all single page app training classes. The last three years, I've been doing a lot of Angular JS training. We wrote our own, uh, put everything together from scratch. Um, and now in the last year, kind of struggled through where the Angular team was for almost an entire year of, is it done yet for Angular 2, which they finally finished in September. Um, so we have a fully working class, three-day workshop in that. Um, and also um, one in React as well, because we were waiting for the Angular team to get done, and hey, we had a couple months. So we dug deeply into React and have a nice three-day workshop on that as well. And I've taught both for customers and got some good feedback. So what I did here, um, it's always good to kind of, as, as jazz musicians would say, woodshed or work on your stuff and come back after practicing, right? Everyone has a side project or a passion project that they do. I am a drummer, which means I don't know what pitch is, but I know what hitting things is. And so, please stand by. Um, so I built a little uh, MIDI keyboard integration uh, application to do like drum machine kind of stuff. So this, the, the story of this was um, back in the fall, uh, I was experimenting with generating audio from Angular using something called RxJS or observables. And the thought was I needed something to try to show how these uh, interactive objects would work in the real world and why not make something physically do something for me. So, you know, playing a keyboard, making noise, maybe eventually it's gonna work. Um, anyway, so I wanted to try something that would actually emit audio and do it through the observable chain. So that's what started this whole thing off. Uh, I did a talk at Google in New York City, uh, and it was basically an, an IoT talk. I had a little IoT device that was a, uh, a little touch-sensitive keyboard thing, and as I touched the different keys, it would emit different MIDI notes, input that into the browser, and then from there, generate web audio through a synthesizer um, using observables. But that was kind of a geeky little project and not all that interesting, and so I figured maybe I could turn it into some sort of gamification thing, and that's where the drum machine part of it came in, and, and the drum audio. So it ended up being um, a number of different technologies that I used to put this together. First of all, Angular 2 at the time. Now we were at ng-conf, uh, Rich and I, and at ng-conf they announced Angular 4, so I said, well, I have to have an excuse to upgrade it, so I changed the version numbers, rebuilt it, and it actually worked without any changes. I'm like, good, I made it through Angular uh, 2 to 4. So this sample really isn't super Angular heavy, it's more uh, RxJS heavy than it is Angular features, but it was really Angular 4 at this point. I'm using RxJS, the observable library. I'm using ngRx Store, which is a state machine for storing the game state, and web audio and web MIDI. So those are the highlights of what we're doing in this little game here. So Web MIDI is basically part of a standard that's been around since dirt, as I like to say. This little, these little DIN cables at the back of this, they're circular, at the back of the synthesizer are called MIDI in and out cables. And MIDI is basically, I think, like a serial port type of um, electronic traffic that tells different devices what notes are being played or tells the devices to play notes. Hence, some are input and some are output. You can have a sequencer telling a keyboard to play a certain type of set of keyboard notes. You can have a keyboard taking MIDI notes off and then put it into a tone module on another device and make sound. So MIDI's been around forever. It turns out that um, uh, probably about 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, they converted to USB MIDI. So the USB standard has a MIDI piece of the protocol as well. And so device manufacturers began to create MIDI devices that plug in with USB instead. So this little thing has a USB cable, connects in, and the computer can recognize that and treat it as MIDI data, just like the old DIN cable MIDI stuff. And almost all the newer MIDI devices have those as well. Turns out that Chrome actually has a built-in web MIDI API. It's a standard they tried to put out, and I think there are several other browsers that also support it in some fashion. Um, but it's actually a working draft at w3.org. And so there's an API to actually connect Chrome to whatever connected MIDI devices are on your system. So I'm using that. Uh, and so whenever we start up an application, I say, hey, what are all the MIDI devices? And if it's these particular named devices, I connect them up and I watch for events. 
doing web audio, I'm broken little link there, but uh, the, the web audio API for my audio sounds, but I'm actually using a, an API called Tone.js on top of it. And Tone.js just abstracts the web audio API. And up until last week, I wasn't using that. I was directly writing my own web audio API. But I realized after a while, and after watching a demo someone else did at ng-conf, wow, that's a lot less code than I had to write. So I'd love to gut my code and replace it with Tone.js, and it took me a day. And I was able to get rid of all my web audio code. If you go back and look at the repo from two weeks ago, you'll see a ton of it. Now it's down to like seven lines of code, which is great. I'll take it. Um, but web audio is a standard that all games on the browser are playing audio through web audio. Uh, pretty much every modern browser supports web audio. It's part of HTML5. The heart of this thing is observables, uh, which is the shorthand name of one of the objects in reactive JavaScript. This is originally a Microsoft library as part of the Microsoft reactive um, initiative. There was like Java and JavaScript and Scala and all sorts of programming languages that support, uh, maybe Scala, that support uh, reactive APIs. And they created version 5. And when they did that, they opened up a website, reactivex.io, and the project under it's RxJS. And that's the one that Angular uses, built into Angular. It's basically one of the dependencies they install. And so for anything that has to have a stream of information, they use RxJS. So that's what I've been using for my code. And again, we're on Angular 4. It's a component-driven, single-page application platform. So the deal there is that you know, companies have been looking at what they're going to migrate their current technologies to. The two big names that keep coming up for JavaScript front-end apps are um, React and Angular. Uh, Angular 4 now is the current version. Um, and it turns out that if you're looking at an enterprise, and the enterprise is going to onboard a lot of developers and write a fair amount of code. If you had to choose between the two, the drivers are either you are very strong at JavaScript and want a very thin core, which is what React gives you, and then your team wants to completely architect a platform from that core. That's what you're going to get out of React. So React does really good work at creating a component API. It doesn't do anything else by itself. It needs help from all these other libraries, which it doesn't pick for you. So you have to go hunting and pecking and finding what you want. And there are some samples out there and starters that do a lot of integration for you. But you're basically in a world where you've got a ton of libraries that are not really necessarily integrated with each other um, and kept up to date. So you'll have to play that game. It's a good API for components, but everything else you have to make selections. Angular is one for the enterprise developer, where you want to already have a, a network library built in, an animation library built in, and a way of updating the DOM, um, and you know background processing and things like that, working with web workers. Um, all that is built into Angular itself. And so when you install Angular, you're installing kind of like a spring for the client, if anyone is familiar with spring. Um, Spring on a Java side does dependency injection. It's easily testable. Angular does the same thing. It's got dependency injection. It's easily testable. Um, and it has a lot of same kind of thought processes behind it. Um, but uh, it's also very component driven. So you'll get very similar APIs to React, at least in terms of concept, for the component part of it. And that's at angular.io. And so that's what's hosting the application. Now, we'll look deeper into the guts of the application as I go along, but observables, which are the things that basically emit messages when things happen, are kind of a stream of data. They're not really organizing that in any kind of state. So one of the things that uh, a lot of developers around Angular and RxJS have put together is a group of projects under the heading NGRx. Um, ng for Angular, Rx for RxJS. It's a bunch of integration libraries that do certain things. So the two that I'm using in this app that really made the app easy to put together are NGRX Store. And NGRX Store is a state machine built on top of RxJS, Reactive JavaScript. And what it does is it takes that pattern called Redux, which is a very popular web pattern that Facebook came up with. Um, and it implements it, that, that state management pattern using observables. And so if you look at the API and you look at, look at how it's built, it directly tracks with how Redux works. 
In fact, they are compatible with Redux for even the Redux dev tools. So I can watch all the state changes and time travel and do everything I could do with Redux just by using NGRX store. And I'm using a side effects library that's part of it as well um, to kind of help me move from one state to the next mechanically and, and um, kind of autonomically, where as if I'm doing a certain action, I want immediately to switch to another action, or I want to count down a timer, kind of do it in an automated way, I can use effects. So I'll show you how those work and how I'm kind of automating part of the library. And all this is available for you to download on GitHub and take a look at and, and beat up and fork and do whatever you want with. So let me start by playing the game, and I'm scared to death because I've modified it so much that I've borked it. So let me start the only way I know how to reset a program, which is kill the tab. Now it's gone. And now it's definitely gone. Please stand by. All right, so the app is loaded. So what this is is kind of like a uh, Guitar Hero kind of game where you're following along, trying, oh, trying to hit the pattern, and you can do it as many times as you have left on the counter on the right, and when it switches to another time, it flips to another pattern. The idea is drummers don't practice. They never practice. They also don't get A's in school, they're drummers. If anyone's ever known a drummer, I can attest that in high school I was a terrible student. I was listening to Rush, man. Bam. Anyway, so that's the game. And what I do is I score different levels, and at the end, I give you a little output. Really, it's a kind of trivial game. But the point being that it's gamification of practice. So I have this working out front on a MIDI, key, on a MIDI drum pad. You can do it with a keyboard. If you don't have a MIDI drum pad, do not worry about that. Wow, I'm bad. That's better, right? So <laughs> point being, at the end, we'll get a score. So that's the game. It's really, there's nothing to it. But I wanted to do it through observables and RxJS and see what's going on. While I was there, the original synthesizer is still hiding in here. Um, so. I cannot play keyboards, but point being, there's an audio oscillator integration as well, so I can hook into different MIDI keyboards, and that was the original demo that I had. So I'll take you through kind of both of those things that I'm doing there, how I'm generating audio from MIDI down through web audio using observables, and then looking at the game on top of that and the drum pad integration. Here is a sadly rough and very quick and hasty diagram. Um, so I've got an Angular 4 component, an outer component. Actually, it's only one. I didn't really need to do much here. This is one big component. And what's happening is, is there's a bunch of data bound to this component that is automatically pushed to it whenever the game changes its state. And specifically, there are a couple of hot areas on here. There's the general state of the game itself, which is like the score, Right, so how many points did I make for each of the types of moves? There's what the patterns are that I'm trying to reach. There's how far I've gotten along to do a match. All those are basically state in the game itself. And then there's content around each of the different levels of the game. And over here on the right, there's like a, down, a, a, a timer clock that ticks backwards. So all these are integrated using observables. There's, there's basically one observable, which is the state of the game that keeps getting updated every time the state changes. And the UI automatically redraws and updates itself. There's a couple of key services, and services are kind of non-visual objects in Angular, like your business objects. So components are your physical UI widgets and objects, and services are the things behind them that make the work get done, right? And so there's where the, that's where you put the logic. And so I've got a couple of key ones in here. One of them is a gameplay machine, which is the one that automates all the state changes, all right? So that, that is my um, NGRX store engine, 
is backed by that service, or fronted by that service, I should say. There's also a simple synthesizer service which wraps Tone.js to make these little noises. And, and that's Tone.js to web audio. And then there's a MIDI input processor which sips from web MIDI. So web MIDI looks at all the devices connected, picks one or more, subscribes to the messages and sends them along. And at the heart of most of these are simple observables. So the observables, think of those as like a stream. All right, an observable is an object that can stream information. And then what actually integrates the game and the sounds are these adapters I put together. And the adapters basically take the MIDI stream for a given device and then sends it along its way to some other thing or calls APIs. And so the adapters are just a simple layer on top of that between the service and the observable to wire them together. But let's pull back a little bit and just talk in general about observables, because if, if you haven't looked at the API, it bears some exploration. Now, what I did in order to play with this stuff is I actually created an Angular app in about a minute and a half. I keep making that number lower every time I say I did it, but it didn't take long. And um, where is my app? There it is. Called Observable Hacker, that I'll just put a documentation on how to run. It's very easy. All I did was say ng new observable hacker, which ng is the command line for Angular, creates a new app. So it built an application for me. I edited one file, main.typescript.ts. It's my boot booting file. And this is how you can play with some of these more complex APIs in something like Angular. You can import the API and then dump it on window, and that's called cheating. Right? Otherwise, you have to be in a module, in a file, and have a compiler. Well, I'll just throw the darn thing on window and play with it. So the API for, Angular, for, sorry, for React, uh, Reactive JavaScript is RxJS. That's an object. Within it, there are certain things we're going to hack around with a little bit called observable and subject. And I just throw them in window. Now, because I'm on TypeScript, I can't just say window.rxjs equals something. TypeScript is a typed version of JavaScript. It's like, uh, there's no RxJS on window. You can't do that. But we all know in JavaScript, we can use bracket notation and use index property access and cheat. So we just throw it on window anyway. And now the nice thing about this is I can come over to port 8008, which I ran it on a separate port. And there's observable. Woohoo! So we can play around. OK, so we can make some observables work without having to go through a test or something else. Interactive. All right. So an observable is an object that notifies subscribers of any changes to the state that it's watching. And you can create observables a couple different ways. Oh, well, a bunch of different ways, realistically. One way is to kind of quickly create one from some collection you might have. So here's one, right? This is observable.from. And I can just say, give me an observable from this array of data. So I'm just going to steal that and steal the thing below it. So now I've got this sequence. It's an observable. They have all these base classes and things. So it's an array observable, an observable fed from an array. And the array is hiding inside of here. So what can I do with this? Well, I can basically subscribe to it and watch it. Okay, So I'll steal that code, and we'll talk about it. So what we have here is a simple subscription to an observable object. Here's the observable object. I can then say subscribe to it, and you get three callbacks. The first callback is, every time I get a new thing from the observable. So the way it works with arrays is every element will call the callback. So I'm going to get four callbacks. And the value of the callback will be whatever value I'm feeding from the observable. So it's going to be a callback for one, callback for two, callback for four, callback for five. If there was a problem, which there won't be here, or if I think I might have problems, I could register a second callback for error. So in this way, it's kind of like a multi-shot promise. Right, in JavaScript, we have promises that are like the one-shot version of this. You get the answer, you get a failure. 
right? Those are the two callbacks you normally have. So in observables, it's the answers, S, until you unsubscribe or shut it off. You either end it up here or you end it in the actual subscription. You say, I'm done listening or I'm done sending. And then there's a very final callback of, I'm done, you can clean up now. So whatever you want to do, that's the third callback if you want to pay attention to it. So when we call this, it just immediately emits one, two, four, and five, because those were the four values in the observable, and then it calls the callback, and now we're finished. All right, so one more time through that, we've got a, we've got a sequence, which is an observable from an array. We then called subscribe on it, and we outputted all the four values, and output the done message when we we're finished, complete. So that's not much different than for each, right? If you've done for each, well, like, I don't have to do all this garbage. I'll just do a for each. And that's fine when you've got data that you already own or that you're generating you know, automatically in JavaScript with a generator, you could do that same thing. You could write an iterator or something like that. The benefit of observables is these can be very long running things and you could be having more than one subscription to it at the same time, it will deliver to all the subscriptions. So various parts of the system can subscribe to different pieces of the data in the observable or the whole thing. And they can do a lot more than just that. So it's, it's kind of a higher order API on top of sending data around. So a higher order function, right? It's a function that's gonna operate on this data. So let's say we're taking the sequence and we wanna basically multiply it by two and give ourselves a new output based on that sequence. We can call sequence.subscribe, like we did before, grab our data, and you know, we can console log it, whatever we want. We can also say, you know what, I wanna change the result. I wanna map it to itself times two. So let's do that. And I'm just gonna grab this much because I can't recreate a constant. You're right, I can't recreate a constant, Ken. You're not that smart. There we go, let's try again. Let, that's better. And that didn't quite work. Oh, you know what, I'm doing it wrong. Please stand by while I screw this up. Yeah, it figures, never mind. There's a, there's a version of this that worked and I lost it, but map will take the results that you get and it will return them uh, with a change. And I screwed that up, let me do another one. Let me try filter instead. No, you know what, it bothers me now, hold on. All right, so now I've got a sequence. All right, so that's not doing anything I want it to do. Observable from and map. That's right, never mind. I'm having a brain fade right now. It's been a long week for me. So let's skip that one. I do maps all the time, but for whatever reason with observable from, it's not paying nice attention. Let's try this one instead. So this one is creating an observable with an interval of 300 milliseconds. So if I just did that, now every 300 milliseconds, it's gonna output a number. And I don't know if you saw the code because I was rather quick with this, but <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, I take the answer of that and I call it subscription. So if I want to clear the subscription, I say subscription dot complete. I don't care anymore. Turn it off. Right? So you can tell it not to pay any more attention by closing or completing the subscription on the client side or the thing that's pulling it. 
You can also, from the code that's generating the observable, you can end the observable. Right? You can stop sending, and then it will call the closed method at the end and say, I'm finished. Which is what from was doing. It just basically said, once I get to the fourth one, I'm going to close down the subscription, and now you get the subscription closed method. But what I was showing you there is another way to generate an observable based on an interval. And they have things for like timeouts as well. So you can say, in 30 seconds, run this one shot and call my callback and we're done. This is saying every 300 milliseconds, call this thing. So if you have something that needs to refresh a graph based on data, maybe you do this every half second or a second, you call a service, get an answer, update the graph. You could do like an interval for that kind of thing. We can get even more um, clever than the interval. We can do what I have on this slide, which is I only want to see every 10th one. Don't deliver me anything but every 10th. So any, any interval value that is the 10th one. And so now, even though it's generating a lot of these, I'm only paying attention to every 10th. I mean, it's a really academic example, but you may have need for something like that, that you only want certain pieces of data. And so in the synthesizer, what I do is I look for different note values, and in some note values, I output a tone. Right? That's, that's Schoenberg, apparently. And then in other ones, I send a trigger to a sample of a drum. When I press down versus when I let up, different things happen. So I'm filtering the MIDI messages based on that to do this. So that's going to come into play here. But let me just show you. I'm going to talk through the concept of map for a second. The reason map exists is so that you can take data that's coming in from a stream, and for each element of it, you can transform it to something else. All right, so that's what map is all about. And I'm just tired and burned out, so my syntax is wrong. You can also do things like this. You can throttle, meaning I only want to see things every so often, no matter how many there are, based on time. So I could do something like this. So this is saying, I'll have an interval every 300 milliseconds, I want to throttle the answers to every 600 milliseconds of that output. So now it's time-based, as opposed to some sort of filtering expression that's actually more deterministic, less time generated. Or I could say, you know what? I know there's a stream of observables here. I only want the first 10. So take 10 and then close down. So there's all these really cool operators that you have. And if anyone here is a Scala developer or Scala Z or whatever, you're looking at that and go, yeah, who cares? We do that too. And that's fine. But now you can do it on the client as well. Well, you can do it in Scala JS, I guess, too. <laughs> but the point being that in Angular and in other apps that want to use RxJS, you've got this composability of streams of data. And it's useful. Now. How do I do audio processing with observables? Well, first of all, there's my synthesizer service. And yeah, there's a junk, bunch of code on here, but it's actually all Tone.js code. So Tone.js is a library, gives you an object called Tone, and then on it are a bunch of other collected functions and objects to create audio. So the first thing is I create like a reverb sound, which is like an, uh, kind of like a presence sound, um, echo chamber kind of sound. And I give it a certain value, and I connect it to something called Tone Master, All right? The Tone Master. And the Tone Master is the output. It's the destination in web audio to your speakers. And then I create a little effect called a vibrato effect. And so that's if I'm playing keyboard. Well, that's not it. Vibrato. All right. So I'll vary the amount of vibrato that I set, and I set a default value for that. Um, the gain, how loud it's going to be. That's not working. But um, <laughs> there's a volume knob, and I can adjust the volume. Um, I have a limiter so it doesn't get too loud and pop the audio and, and distort. And then ultimately, something called a synthesizer, which lets me have up to eight different voices or keys. I can play up to eight at a time based on what I set up here. And each of them is going to be a particular synthesizer type. 
there's a thing called chain on here, and chain puts them all together. So this says, generate eight tones max, and then chain them to vibrato, then reverb, then gain, then limiting, then the master. So you can build up an audio processing chain, kind of like putting effects units together, which is kind of cool. And again, when I saw this, I'm like, my god, I had to do all this hard coded. I only got the volume and waveform, right? I got that far with my regular audio processing, and it was like hundreds of lines of code. I'm like, I give up, right? When I saw Tone.js, I'm like, OK, note to self, when I get back from ng-conf, rewrite this in Tone.js. And again, it took me two days. Really not a big deal. So this represents hundreds of lines of code you would write with web audio. Then once I have that, here are some methods in this synthesizer class. There's one called play note. And there's a lot of internals here for the synth, so you don't have to worry too much about these. You can look at the code. But I've got a play note where I just say, if you give me the note name and a certain amount of velocity or how hard you hit it, it doesn't really transmit here, but you can get louder or softer notes. Um, when you let up on a note, stop it. So it tells it to trigger the release of that particular note and so on. The detuning, that's for the, the, the pitch wheel. Right? So as I'm turning that up and down, MIDI messages are being sent, and I'm intercepting those messages and calling this, giving it the range that I'm being sent, and I adjust that in, in code. So it works well with the web audio settings. Um, the vibrato, same thing, and so on, and volume. Now for the drums. Tone actually has a nice little API for that. And this looks a little ugly, but I'm going to walk you through it. Um, Tone.sampler is what hooks up an audio sample, a WAV file in this case. And it gives me something I can trigger right away. So forget the stuff in the middle for the second, but I can say, in this drum machine service, yes, I've got, a, I've got this weird thing here that is kind of an observable, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I've got this thing called left buffer and right buffer. And the idea is it's left and right pads. So left, right, OK? Left buffer is a new tone sampler. And the first parameter is the name of the file. And then the second parameter is a callback that gets called when it's done loading it. So I take advantage of that. This little thing on the right is an arrow function. right? And a TypeScript or ECMAScript arrow function. So it says, do this little anonymous function here. And so in that, I take this thing called drum stroke stream, which is an observable, a special type of observable, a stream of data called a subject, which I'll explain what that is in a minute. That is getting commands like left and right. So the MIDI comes in, somewhere in my code, I take that MIDI and I say, OK, this MIDI note on this device generates a left stroke. This note on this device generates a right. So I come in here and I say, filter it. And so for the left one that I built, I filter. The data coming in is a string. And the filter says, if the expression is true, you get this value. So I only pay attention to data that is of left. So now I know that's a left stroke. In that case, I'm going to subscribe to that stream. So I only get the left notes in this particular thing. And I trigger the stroke which is, this is part of the game, and then I actually trigger the audio as well. So there's the gameplay part where I hit the left note for the game, and there's actually the audio output as well. I've actually cleaned this up into one nice little delegated method now that's completely separate. So it just says hit, hit left or hit right, something like that. But the point being, now I've got a stream that is looking for only left notes of drum samples, and we'll play this audio sound. So the left ones play the snare. And the right ones play the tom. And that's it. And I've got some setup work. Mostly this is around Angular and me um, wrestling each other to the ground, <laughs> uh, setting up the actual stream of data. So we'll skip that for the moment. But there's an outer API here that, that actually kicks off and triggers the drum strokes for things like a keyboard key, uh, which is over here. So my left and right. Oh, there's the summary, by the way. Anyway, Web MIDI. This is the direct Web MIDI API. If you open up Chrome and you put this in your Chrome developer tools and you have a MIDI keyboard plugged in, it will tell you 
You can say navigate or request MIDI access. Doesn't even ask, it just, it just lets you do it. And it will give you a promise. They actually use the promise API because this is a little newer of an API. And they give you an access object, which is an object that represents what you have access to. And in true overblown API, by the way, I'll take a side note here. Web audio, <laughs> web MIDI, these APIs were written by people who like to write a lot of code. There's lots of method calls. I'm like, can you just bundle them up a little bit more? So what they do is they give you a thing called an iterator, which in Java script, uh, ECMAScript uh, 6 is a little more complicated than a regular iterator. But it basically walks through them. So I can walk through each of these values that come back. So each, each one is a physical device or logical software device for MIDI. And I'm just walking through them in my code and I'm looking for one for a particular device name. This is the MPK-225. The MPK-225 by Akai happens to have one device called this which represents the keys I want and the information I, I'm caring about. It's a MIDI port. So I'm, sim I'm simplifying this logic from what I'm doing a little bit, but if it is the one I want, then I set up a callback for it. And the callback in web MIDI is on MIDI message and it just sends you a MIDI object simple JavaScript object with properties on it that I then parse into something I care about. What I'm doing that I'm not showing here, I should have put that on the screen, is I'm actually taking those and I'm parsing them into MIDI message objects. And so let me see if I can find that for you. Because I think it's useful to see. So in my uh, app, I've got this thing called MIDI Input Processor Service. What are we doing, Tom? We're doing good. And it's got a lot of little pieces to it, but right here, that, this, is the, this is the core of the whole thing. And there's some things to talk about here. So up above this, I've identified this as the device I want. So I'm assuming for this, I found a device I want, I'm gonna open it up, and I'm going to watch it for MIDI data. So there's an open method on the device. The open method begins the ability to subscribe and listen to messages. I then, and that's promise driven, I then will get a subscription object when it's open. From there, I register my on MIDI message, and now, this is not an observable, but it looks a lot like one. So this is the, their own API they made up. And I get a, a payload of data, which is a MIDI message. And notice what I do, I put things around a set timeout. And the reason I did that is I didn't want to have this hold on to the user interface thread whenever it made a noise. I wanted to let it go right away. And then on the next scheduled tick of the JavaScript engine, it's going to register that a note was sent. And what I'm doing is I'm sending it to this thing called data stream. Data stream is an observable of a type called subject. And in RxJS, a subject observable is one that not only can something subscribe to, but on the other side, something else can send messages to it. Or in other words, generate the data. So a subject is how you as a programmer generate data and make it an observable for others to use. Right, so if I want to programmatically create data, I create an observable, instead of observable, it's just called subject. So that's what this is. This is a subject of type MIDI message. And every time I get a message, I create a new MIDI message object. The constructor kind of parses it apart. And that goes into the observable. And then other things, such as the code in here, watches that stream. The name has changed, protect the innocent. Um, watches that stream and filters it and says, this MIDI message, so this example is an adapter for the particular device. It says, this MIDI message needs to be coming from the KMC multipad. This is now the drum device, but same concept. It has to have a velocity, meaning it has to have been hit. It turns out that that drum device gives me two messages, which is kind of stupid, but it says, I hit it and now it's stopped. And so when I was paying attention to it and not looking at the velocity, I got two notes. Why? I don't know. That's the only device I found do, doing that for me. So for whatever reason, the drum pad says, you hit me, I'm done being hit. And they're both MIDI note ons, which is wrong, I think. But whatever. 
So I have to have some sort of velocity. If it's 38 or 50 on that drum pad, those are snare and tom, then I trigger left or right notes. So this thing here is an adapter that takes MIDI data coming in and then generates something or does something to it on the way out. All right, so that's how I get the audio generated. What about the game itself? So the game is one part and the audio is another part. They, they, they work together, but they're really totally separate units. The game needs to know where I am in the gameplay. So if I hit escape, I just reset the game. If I start hitting notes, you know, I'm, I'm sending a stroke to the game. The timer is counting down the game and all that. Those are all different things that happen in the game. So I'm tracking all of them using NGRX store. Again, which is the thing that implements Redux on top of RxJS. Here's the basic state machine of the game, right? Here's our start and end state. And it's, I'm leaving out a few inter intermediate states, but they're minor. So we start playing the game, and it says, all right, start with the next pattern, which is the very first pattern. So I had patterns left, start the timer. Once the timer started, something automatically decrements the timer by one second. Check to see if the timer is exhausted. Nope, keep doing that. So every second, we're hitting a state change that drops the time by one second in the timer. When we reach zero, the timer is exhausted. We go to the next pattern. Is there another pattern? Yes, move on. Show the next pattern, start counting down. It's a really simple game. And then if we're done with all the patterns, there's like 14 to torture you with, then we go and we go to the end of the game, we show the summary. Okay, there's a lot of little inter intermediate things inside of there to get the things to move along, but for the most part, that's the state. And I call it my terrible state diagram because I'm terrible at drawing, <laughs> at least the last minute, which is what that was, so. All right, so a couple technical terms here. Actions is some sort of stimulus from the outside world. So an action would be left stroke, um, it would be start game, right, end game, that kind of thing. NGRX store deals with things called reducers. So for every time you send an action to NGRX store, it wants to run through its reducer or reducers and take the state that it has now and the action you sent it and replace the state with a new state. That ends up becoming a big switch statement, essentially. Um, so it basically says, well, if the action is begin game, then we'll do this kind of logic. We'll replace the state with one that represents the fact that we're beginning the game. You can then select with a selection, or a selector actually is the right term for that. You can make a selection in the state and subscribe to it, and they give it to you as an observable. So as the game changes, it will notify you of the changes in the state of the game, or pieces of whatever you're looking at. All right, so there's a function to build called a reducer. There's the store that contains the reducers. And there are actions that you can take to tell the reducer that you want to go to the next state or the next proper state. And then you can subscribe to the changes in the state. All right, so let's take a look at, at this stuff now. All right, so I've got a state machine in here. A lot of the work will be done in game actions. I'll talk about effects a little, uh, a few minutes later. And in the actual um, gameplay machine. So let's look at the gameplay machine. This is kind of my outside API. So this is what I would inject to something else to, to, to communicate and do things. So the first thing it does is it gets created, and, and like Java with, with dependency injection, this is the way Angular 2 does dependency injection. You inject a type into a constructor. That's the general way you do it. So we're saying, when you start gameplay machine, I want you to give me a store object, which you can look at if you want to look at the code. You'll see how I configure the NGRX store. That's a fully configured state machine that knows how to run its reducer, and it's called store. 
And the other thing I want to do is I want to tell it to subscribe to the gameplay state by selecting this node. So this node is called gameplay. Gameplay is the top node in my state store. And I'm going to hold on to that and call it gameplay state in my state machine. All right, so the gameplay machine is the thing that's going to then feed the user interface with its data. And it gets fed by updating the observable, which then triggers updating the user interface. And then we have little methods that we call play, pause, resume. Some of these work, some of these don't. Um, but the basic gameplay is, is available to some degree from here. Wrong key, OK. The reducer is the heart of everything in this thing. So let's talk about the reducer. And the other thing is, I've typed the data in the state store as a TypeScript object. So there's a thing called gameplay state, and gameplay state is what has all the properties of the game. This could definitely be refactored and cleaned up, but it's functional at the moment, so at least I have something that works. Um, you'll see, for example, I've got the total score. I've got whatever the score in the current level is. I've got what the received pattern is so far. There's like a displayed pattern to show the user interface and things like that. I've got kind of a little state setting thing here to keep track of whether the game is started or stopped. And by the way, yes, you have the ability to create enumerations like this in TypeScript, so you can kind of reason about your code a little better than you would in plain old JavaScript. Um, and so there's settings like that. Here's the reducer itself. And you can see it's basically a switch statement. It gets called whenever we dispatch an action to the store. So there's a dispatch method on the store. It takes an action. The actions have parameters. When that happens, the gameplay reducer is called. It's given the current state that it already has. It's then given an action. And then you return either nothing. You say return the same state we already have, no change. Or you return a new state. You should always create a new one. That's the Redux pattern. And they do that because if you replace the state, then they can detect that the object was replaced. So they send an update to your subscriptions. So you're not supposed to mutate. You're supposed to replace. So let's say we do begin game, right? That's process begin game. I just have a little helper method in here. And this is a pretty straightforward Redux action. And I want to kind of explain what happens here. So we're going to return object.assign. And what is that? So object.assign creates a new object based on the information in the first object. All right, so that's basically if you give it curly braces, I'm doing a brand new one. If instead I said initial state here, it would just be updating initial state. So, and this is an ECMAScript 6 and 7 thing. If you want to create a new object with object assign, the first parameter could be curly braces. That says start with an empty one. Then take all the properties from the next objects that you pass in. This is all the properties of my initial state, which is how we reset the game with that starting state. And then we switch the game state to playing. So now see that's the third overlay. And it does them in order. So it says start with empty, copy all the properties from initial state, then copy game state from, from this thing and make it playing. So then we have a, let's see, when we do the playing state, I'm going to skip over a little bit of information. Um, let's jump down to send stroke. Send stroke says I've sent a left or a right key. One of the things you'll see a lot in these Redux actions is do no harm and get out early. So if we're not playing the game, then don't even bother changing the state with a, with a stroke. It's just who cares? I don't pay any attention to it. And then this is a lot of math to basically say, what is the pattern? I'm going to concatenate what I just got, uh, which is my action payload, the, the character I hit left or right. Concatenate with a receive pattern. Bump up the position in the actual rudiment. Drum, drum patterns are called rudiments. Um, and then check to see if they match or not and do some state change logic based on that. Ultimately, if the whole thing matches and I have a full match, 
then for the history of the game, for the patterns in the game, I, I keep a history for each of the levels. I add one to the matches for that level. I update the level score. Probably should just do this a little simply. And then I flip the rudiment position back to the beginning again, and I empty out the pattern. So I just add points at that point. Otherwise, I you know, keep adding to the position and keep going. And if it just doesn't match at all, then I reset it. So the, the part of the game where it resets is, right, I'm playing this game, and I go right, right, up, clear, right, left, right, clear. Right, that's that state as well. All right. At the end of all this, you know, whenever I'm, this is particularly for the, for the drum stroke thing, I create a new state and I replace it with the, with the state that I figured out in that function. This probably could be more elegant, right? But it's passion project side thing, so I keep cleaning it up. Maybe someday it'll be four lines of code. I don't know. Convert to React or something. Um, anyway, and so I've got all these other states. Now, here's, here's a challenge. And you'll, you'll Google search and like, well, how do I do automated countdowns or automated timers? And someone will say, well, all you really have to do is do like a set time out of 60 seconds. And then when you're done, say, okay, change the state to time out, right, or whatever you're gonna do. So now I get a 60 second delay on the countdown. I don't get it by second. So it gets a little weird to be able to do that in just one hit. So enter another library called Game Effects or I should say called NGRS, NGRX effect. And NGRX effect is very function driven, so it's a very functional programming library. Uh, it lets you create a class that's a service, install it as an effects library or effects API, and then what you can do is you can say this, which is the effects library, dot actions, which is the variable they give you, which represents the action stream of type, and now I can say I care about this action type or that action type or what have you. And there's different functions that do different types of things. So for example, if I triggered begin game, if I intercept that, I can then say I'm going to trigger the next pattern action. So yes, it does the begin game thing and resets, but right after that, it sends along another um, dispatch to kick off the next pattern. Let's see. Um, now the next pattern action is going to basically give me a brand new updated rudiment and there's an array of rudiments that I pulled this in from right here, reset the state of the rudiment, and now I've moved on to the next one in my list. And also, it's updating something called a rudiment ID or position, which is basically, I start with rudiment zero, end at rudiment 13, and I'm done with the game. If it kicks off the timer, and somewhere in here I start the timer, if, if we start the timer, then we say, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna grab the payload of start timer, that's what that map to payload does. I'm gonna grab that payload of the start timer, which is say 15 or 20 or 30 seconds, and then I'm gonna switch it to timer decrement action. So now it goes to timer decrement action of type timer decrement. I grab the payload, this, this map to payload again, this is how I get the parameter out of the request. So let's say that the timer decrement said I have seven seconds left, right? If I say map to payload and then call switch map, switch map basically says, I know you were mapping through this one observable, but I'm going to switch the focus of this to the other observable. And switch map after a map to payload gets the actual payload from the timer decrement. So it hurts your head a little bit. Like the, uh, yesterday, the NPR speaker was talking about how NGRX or, or RxJS can kind of hurt your head at first, and NGRX is probably triple that. But what this is doing is basically saying, grab the payload from this action, make it the new call for switch map, so I'm now going to look at the payload, and I can see how many seconds I have left. If I have more than zero seconds left, I do an observable timer, which basically goes to sleep, 
for the number of ticks, which I did 1,000, 1,000 milliseconds. So it goes to sleep for a, sec a second, and then when it's done, it maps and triggers another action, timer decrement action. So we go back and do it again. But the benefit of this is, once it does the go to sleep and comes back again, dirty checking is checked. It notices that it might have changed the state, which it will in the actual action, and the UI will redraw when the timer counts down. Okay, so the effects and the actions work together. If I look at the timer decrement action, I should be able to find a timer decrement in here somewhere. Yeah, here it is. Timer decrement is just gonna take the time left and make it the payload, so it's ticking down each time. So the state is just changing and changing time left from 15 to 14 to 13 to 12 to 11 to 10 to nine. So the, the effect will force it to keep counting down until we reach zero, in which case we say score the current pattern. Notice you can do two actions here. I'm gonna dispatch a score pattern action, and what that does in my game, basically takes a look at the rudiments. If it's not a valid rudiment, I just get out. Um, it grabs the current state of the score and sets it as the level score for that current level, and it adds it to an array of level scores. All right, so it adds it to a property called score log. So that's how at the end I can give you kind of a Clearly, I didn't do anything here, but I can give you like a various like settings of like what you did in each of these. All right, so the effects plus the reducers gives you the ability to deal with state changes either directly by just dispatching to a reducer, right, dispatching an action to the state store, or to sip through the state store and say, you know what, I want to act on this when this state occurs, when this particular action type is dispatched, I want to act and do my own thing. I want to create a side effect for that normal hit. So it's interesting, I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't have a lot of background in game design, clearly, um, but at least it's, it's, it's an example of the types of things you can do with observables in Angular um, with RxJS. So, I guess the question that you need to ask yourself is, do you need this level of complexity in any way, shape, or form? And 90% of the time, you probably don't. But you will be using observables a lot in Angular because observables are used for things like network responses and typing into the keyboard you know, and, and changing values in forms. You actually get generated callbacks that are observables. You can actually grab an observable and say, give me the stream of all the changes for this input field. And I want to debounce it so that I only get it every second. And so as I get it every second, I'm going to kick off an Ajax call. Oh, but if there's one happening right now, cancel that one and switch to this one. And you can do all that through observables. So really, the power of Angular isn't even so much Angular. It's the component API in Angular is nice. Services are kind of plain vanilla services in Angular. They're pretty straightforward once you learn them. But the real power of Angular, I think, is really locked up in the observable API. There's really a lot of good stuff hiding in there. All right, so a couple other challenges. This was just a game challenge. So <laughs> MIDI gives you note numbers, 0 to 127. Um, but the API for Tone.js and for Web Audio wants a frequency. At least Tone.js was nice enough to say, give me C sharp. Well, that's helpful, right? So if I said C sharp zero, C pound sign zero, it would play the zeroth C sharp on the scale, which is nice. But I don't have that from MIDI. I have four or whatever it's going to be. So I had a cheat, and what I did I did this before I added Tone.js because I used frequencies before Tone.js, but uh, let me find it in here. I create a real simple note translation engine. And what this is, is it's Wikipedia's frequency entries, so your mileage may vary. This may not be the well-tempered clavier, or it may be the sickly-tempered clavier. But, so what I do is I created just an arbitrary JavaScript array called notes, static, and you're looking at static in JavaScript, it's TypeScript, so yes, static. Um, TypeScript compiles to JavaScript, but you can think about it almost like a truly typed API. 
So I have a notes API here, a notes uh, array, and for each note, I track what the valid note names are in an array and the frequency in hertz. And boy, does it hurts. <laughs> Oh, that's bad. Uh, and then I have a couple of little helper functions, one of which I use. I, I just, just need to have the first note name I get. D sharp 8 and E flat 8 are the same note. I could care less. I just need to emit one of them for Tone.js to pay attention. So if I get, I don't know, this is probably number 78 or whatever. Um, if I get note 78 from the MIDI keyboard, I ask it for it by its physical position in MIDI. I get this back, and I tell Tone.js to play that, that note. Easy. Okay, and so it's pretty responsive. And again, I play guitar and drums, I don't play keyboards. Um, but we get the idea. Um, so that was one of the challenges, and that was really pre pretty easily solved. But the harder one was, and this is what I found as I moved along, Angular and Equascript both have the concept of something called modules. So I'll show you the difference. First of all, Angular modules are an arbitrary construct they came up with to package software and reason about it in terms of dependency injection and use. So here's an example of an NG, Angular module. And by the way, they added this at release candidate seven of eight. Thanks, Angular. They didn't have them in Angular two. They're like, oh, we really need our modules back, and someone really convinced them they put it back in. So NG module defines components, other modules that'll be imported from them, um, services, so providers are my services, and then Bootstrap is the one I boot physically start up. So that's, that's Angular's modules. Equascript modules are this stuff. It's file imports and exports. And they don't really marry directly, and they're confusing um, for example, to make it simpler for you to deal with complexity, there's this concept called a barrel. And so every directory or package can have an index.js file or ts when it starts. And you can export the things inside of the object to make it easier for you to do imports from just that directory name. That's what Angular does with that, Angular slash core. There's an index.js file in there that imports everything else by exporting it from other files. And files themselves in ECMAScript use export to export them, their pieces to things that import them. These are two totally separate concepts with their own weirdnesses. And what I found was the oscillator library, the game library, and the effect of them, they kind of had to be dependent on each other. And the way Angular mounts things if you have a service in a lower level library, you would think that it actually bubbles up and is available for everything. It, if you import it anywhere else, it creates a new instance of it. So, and this all, I'll leave you with this. The last goofy thing I had to do was create these little four root methods that you might have seen if you've used like um, material design libraries. And you might say, what the hell is that for? I found out today what that's for. It turns out that if you want the root module to create the service that you need from the child, you have to provide a method, so look up for root, and you have to tell it, for this module, pre-create these in the root module so that every module can see the services. That's confusing. So I'll be doing a lot of blog entries about this stuff just because it was, it's with conference season, I didn't have any time, but I'm planning on putting a bunch of blog entries out about the things I've learned in building this project. So any questions, please hit me up. You can. You know, reach out to me on uh, Twitter, Rimple on Tech. Uh, you can look at the blog, chariotsolutions.blog. I'm going to be putting a fair number of articles up there. And the full repo is at drumlegend at github.com slash krimple. All right. Thank you.